it wasn't until I got older that I realized like my disability is my greatest superpower and like it makes me absolutely the person I was meant to be uh it's something that I always tell people like if 20 years from now they come up with like a magical cure to like take away my disability what I what I take it what I jump with the opportunity and I say absolutely not because my disability is one of the proudest parts of myself and it makes me everything that I am and I've also learned so many things about people and life because of my disability and it's also given me an immense amount of empathy and understanding of humans that I wouldn't have learned otherwise if it wasn't for my disability. Hi everyone, this is Aletta, founder and creative director of Our Climate Voices. Climate Change is Personal is our new podcast, where we're listening to people's personal experiences with the climate crisis and learning from their wisdom about how to create a future that is resilient, community-based, and centers the leadership of people on the front lines of the crisis. For those of you who are new to Our Climate Voices, we are a collective led by young, queer and trans folks, BIPOC and disabled people working to humanize the climate crisis, catalyze systemic change, and vision the future that we want to make real. So, we mobilize our personal experiences with climate change to hold those who profit from the climate destruction accountable, and we share our collective wisdom about how to embody a resilient, interdependent, and just future. Today, we're hearing from Daphne Frias, an incredible 23-year-old youth organizer from West Harlem in New York City. Climate change is personal to Daphne as they were diagnosed with cerebral palsy at a young age and work as an activist at the intersection of disability justice and climate justice. Having experienced environmental injustices and gentrification firsthand, Daphne is committed to organizing for climate justice solutions in their frontline community and beyond, and they've been working as a public health scholar for over 10 years. Here is Daphne's story. Yeah, uh, so my name is Daphne Frias. Uh, I'm a 23-year-old youth organizer working on the intersections of disability, climate justice, and I also work within the gun violence prevention space. Um, social justice is a huge passion of mine. Uh, being disabled, I learned how to advocate for myself and my community at a really young age. Uh, and I understood quickly that the power of your voice and the power of storytelling is some of our most important tools for an acting change. Something I like to say is that words are the building blocks of revolutions and that with our words and with uh, the power of our voices, anything can happen. Uh, born and raised in West Harlem, uh, I've seen uh, sort of the disproportionality of what it's like to live in a low socioeconomic status and what that um what that looks like as a lived reality uh, especially in terms of the climate crisis where we see how racism plays heavily into urban planning and the way that the commun communities are structured um, and created as opposed to predominantly white communities and the way that they have uh, access to a uh, cleaner air, cleaner environment, and less climate destroying infrastructures. Um, in my neighborhood, we have a bus depot, which is like the largest bus depot for the MTA here in New York City. All the bus, all the main bus lines from Manhattan come out of this bus depot. So we're constantly having buses come in and out. We also have one of the um, major on ramps for the highway system here in the city. Um, so a lot of polluting factors within my neighborhood. Also, um, our, one of our national parks is located in my neighborhood. And interestingly enough, within that national park is a water treatment plant, which I always thought was like a very paradoxical thing to be including in a national park. But hey, I didn't, I didn't plan that. So, um, there was all these things that like, again, I thought was normal. Um, and then I was like, Mm, you know, why, why do like 90% of my friends have asthma? <laughs> and it was, it was then that I realized, oh, this is not, this is not an unplanned, like, coincidence. This is, this is a sy systemic problem. Yeah. So, um, 
To set the scene for what West Harlem looks like, it's not unlike many black and brown communities all across the country in the fact that we have, we live, um, in a food desert. We live, um, in, uh, places that lack open green spaces for people to, um, be out in, in our environments. We have, uh, a disproportionate number of uh, climate destroying infrastructures. We face intense gentrification from Columbia University. Columbia University is 10 blocks away from my neighborhood. Oh, I have such a complicated history with them. Um, but since since my youth, I mean, I'm so young, but since, since my younger youth, <laughs> um, I remember one day, uh, when Columbia was first starting to encroach into our neighborhood, this person knocked on our door and then they were a representative of Columbia University and they handed my mom this pamphlet and it was a whole thing about like, this is what your neighborhood is going to look like with the, with the amazing things that Columbia University is going to put into it. And I remember I was maybe around four at this time, so almost 20 years ago now. And I, we all laughed because we're like, our neighborhood is absolutely not going to look like that. Like, that's crazy. And now when I look outside, it literally looks exactly like they predicted. Um, To the point where, like, neighbors have been pushed out of our buildings. My family is one of the oldest tenants in this neighborhood. My family has lived in this building for 56 years in this very same apartment. And every year we lose neighbors. We lose um, tenants of this community, um, and our elders are constantly being pushed out. Um, and with that comes the intergenerational wealth of storytelling and their stories and their experiences, and we're constantly losing those valuable resources. The thing about the climate crisis and, and frontline communities, we often live in multiple jeopardy situations. We live in double jeopardy situations where it's like, how are we even going to talk about fighting the climate crisis when we don't have food to eat? We don't have a roof over our head when we don't even speak the language of which most of these social welfare organizations operate in, things of that nature. And it's like, the climate crisis is not even in the realm of the conversation of where you're at and your lived experience. So when I first started talking about the climate crisis in my neighborhood, everybody's like, you're crazy. <laughs> like, why are you talking about this when, like, people can't afford their rent? And I was like, you're completely right. Like, why are we having this conversation? But it's understanding that the reason why you can't pay the rent and why the climate crisis exists are exactly the same reason. They come from the same systems of oppression that caused this inequity to exist in the first place. So you can't combat these issues in silos. I think for me, what's been really hard, the biggest thing that I've noticed is that, uh, to be incredibly blunt, now that we have more white people living in our neighborhood, people are listening to us. But they're not listening to the people who've lived in the community for all these years and have been going to uh, community board meetings, who've been trying to meet with our elected officials. They're listening to the people who look like them and the people of privilege. And within the last within the last like, six years or so, we've we've um, been able to restore some of our parks and some of our green spaces. But that isn't because they were listening to us. It's because they want to make our community more amenable to higher socioeconomic status individuals so that we can benefit from their income and they can continue pushing people like me and people like um, those who've lived here all their lives out of this community. I also think it's important to remember that like with gentrification and climate change also comes the silencing of frontline communities and frontline voices where um and this is a huge problem throughout the environmental justice movement as a whole where it's completely whitewashed and frontline communities are not listened to especially communities of color um and even even within my community's climate conversations when the when the community board is trying to bring up sort of environmental 
initiatives, it's always, uh, it's always the white folks leading, leading the conversation and like taking up that space. And it's like, when is the time to step back and when is the time to like let other people hold the space? Um, it's been an incredibly interesting dynamic in that way. But I, I began organizing within my community, um, and I, I've seen an incredible difference over, uh, just taking, uh, ownership over our community and our voice, um, and saying that, like, just because we have these labels on us doesn't mean our life doesn't matter. It doesn't mean our stories don't matter. Um, and that taking agency over our well-beings doesn't make us villains we we have this we have we have a right health care is a right clean clean environments safe environments that's a right and we don't have to feel sorry about fighting for those things disability is hard and obviously there's days where i wake up and i'm like this sucks like i'm i'm there are going to be bad days but the overall experience of disability is some of the most empowering places I've been because we are a community that knows what it's like to not be seen. So we have we have the inability to rely on each other um, and to build community, to share resources, to I mean, I cannot tell you how many times I've been um you know, stranded without medication, without resources and reaching out to community being like, I need this, I need that, or I'm having a really bad day with, you know, this, this illness. Do you have resources to help me? And my community is always there. Um, and I think if the rest of the world had that approach to community and to understanding that we all work together to make each other better, we'd be in a much better place. Uh, I was born, I was born a little tiny, tiny baby. I was one pound, three ounces. Uh, I was born at 27 weeks, so I fit inside the palm of your hand. Um, uh, just for like size perspectives, my diapers were doctors' face masks. So all the face masks that we're wearing right now, a little, those blue surgical masks in specific, those were my diapers all cut up and formed to fit my little tiny body. Um, I was only given a 25% chance to live when I was born. I was in the hospital for three months and I had to have two, uh, two blood transfusions from my doctor. So needless to say, 23 year old Daphne was not, was not supposed to be out here doing the most. <laughs> um, so, uh, and when I was three years old, I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Um, it is, uh, there's multiple forms, but in its most basic form, uh, it is a, a neuromuscular disease that affects other muscles in your body um, and makes your muscles atrophy. So you have less control over your muscle tension, your muscle, your muscles in general. Um, I was diagnosed, uh, like I said, when I was three years old, but what was interesting about my diagnosis was that that the word high functioning was tossed around a lot. What does high functioning mean? What what is even that word? It's like the most annoying word to me because it it, it um it alienates people's people with disabilities and uh, sort of makes you feel like you're not part of the community in general. Even when I was diagnosed, the center that diagnosed me told my parents that they couldn't help me because um, the 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 center they had a they had physical therapy and other um other resources they also had a school on campus but because cognitively i fit into a more general education setting they're like yeah we can't help your daughter and they left two uh low socioeconomic status brown parents without any resources <laughs> whatsoever <laughs> so it was my mom using well it wasn't really the internet at that time it was more like library and other resources to figure out how can i get resources from my daughter and how can i help her um you know 
break through these barriers that she has. Even when I even when I started going to doctors and hospitals, they actually wanted to do this major surgery on me and they wanted to remove all of my lower extremities and replace them with metal. And my mom was like, yeah, we're not doing that. <laughs> um, and shortly after, she um, got me into this specialized preschool with early intervention services like physical therapy and occupational therapy. And by my graduation, I was able to walk across the stage um, when I had no ability to walk prior to that it was actually a surprise for my mom i had been working with my physical therapist for the whole duration of the school year um and then when i would come home i would pretend like i couldn't do anything like i would pretend like i was like i was before um so that when my mom saw me at graduation it was like a complete surprise for her and she was just like bawling in the in the audience it was it was an amazing feeling and a test and I think it was that experience that really shaped me it was it was the first time that I realized that like I could do anything that I set my mind to no matter sort of what the expectations were of other people but I also knew that education and being able to articulate myself um was a way that I could take ownership over the way I was perceived um being disabled being a young woman of color i knew that especially the public school system in new york um they were going to try to box me into special education and other systems that were not beneficial to my growth as a student or as a person um i was actually one of the first young people within the public school system here in new york city to be in a what they call like a hybrid system where I was receiving special education services, but I was in a general education classroom. And from freshman year up until this very last year, I had a history of uh, contracting pneumonia every year. So my respiratory system is incredibly weak, which is why getting COVID was no surprise to me. It was something that I was unfortunately kind of expecting. Um, but that made my my lungs very very weak um and not not being able to withstand the levels of air pollution within my community um to the point where i um developed asthmatic like symptoms um and became very uh sort of reactive to the environment around me um and it was it was how i realized that like so many other people in my community were facing the same thing um but specifically with disabled people, I think it's understanding that we, again, live at the nexus of multiple jeopardy situations. Um, and when we talk about the climate crisis, um, one of the things we always think about is the, um, the increase of, uh, you know, natural disasters and inclement weather. And like people with disabilities don't have the the privilege and the ability to evacuate swiftly and like there's so many people that I know uh to bring into context uh last year's uh California wildfires there's so many friends of mine who lost their mobility devices during these wildfires um oxygen tanks wheelchairs walkers uh, feeding tubes um IVs you name it there were there were so many there were so many things that were lost I also think that we're consistently excuse me we're consistently an afterthought in terms of evacuation plans I also think that like disabled people can also be climate refugees and that's like some something we're not talking about where there's thousands if not millions of climate refugees happen or people becoming climate refugees each year but some of those people are disabled or in the process of of transitioning become disabled um so now not only do you not have a place to live not have a country to call home but you have these comorbidities that are making it incredibly hard for you to exist and then in the countries that have allowed you in you're living in these horrible conditions without access to water or access to healthcare, access to food. Um, I think there's this huge misconception that like 
disability is a one-time event and it can only happen on the onset when in truth disability is a lifelong thing and it can happen to you at any moment uh we've we've welcomed siblings into the, the disabled community because of covid we've welcomed people into the community because of protests and because of the unrest that was happening last summer with the black lives matter movement um disability can always come uh and i think even when we, when we talk about aging um and and elderly individuals there is the natural progression of disability as we get older um so i think it's like removing that that negative connotation and that villainization and being like disability is in, not inherently bad society is the is the construct that teaches us that it is um i also think that accommodations and and the things that disabled people need also benefit able bodied people as well it isn't it isn't just like a end all be all it's for us only for us it benefits entire communities and as our climate changes we can't do anything about it other than become prisoners to our own homes um and that's incredibly frustrating because we're already facing barriers to access and being able to live equitably and now we have to continue to be isolated within our homes because of the change in climate that we're experiencing um i also think as i was saying before the climate crisis and environmental justice desperately needs the innovation empathy and solution making tactics that disabled people have come to rely on for our entire lives i find it very hard to comprehend that the climate crisis and environmental justice has become a political issue like how have we politicized the health of our earth do we have another planet to live on i don't think so so why 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 are we doing this um and the fact that like we have to convince people that like science exists and that like the climate crisis is an actual thing I, I can't I can't it's too much for me um but also understanding that like intrinsically the climate crisis is a public health issue and that like those things are not mutually exclusive like we have to have a public health framework in order to combat the climate crisis uh I am in my first year of getting my MD MPH I've been a public health scholar for 10 years. When you look at like social determinants of health, there's no way that you can separate those things and what affects minority communities and how the climate crisis exists. It there it's as clear as day. I also think that um a public health perspective creates equity in the fact that we have it makes us center the communities that are most impacted by the climate crisis um just right before the pandemic happened i was at this conversation with with um the lancet journal one of the premier medical journals um and it was the first time that the lancet had published um data and uh, literature about climate anxiety um and how physicians um and healthcare workers need to begin uh respecting climate anxiety and understanding that climate anxiety is a real thing um and climate anxiety is only going to continue to grow as we dilly dally on the you know protecting the health of our earth um especially amongst people with disabilities when we're already facing uh multiple health issues and then the reality of the health of our planet is not getting better um i think that that's incredibly um discouraging to to face but i also think that it would feel less discouraging if our voices were actually heard and we were actually able to be part of these conversations um and that i also think what's interesting is that when i i also work a lot around like 
language justice and being able to have access to content when when we talk about the the climate crisis like a cliche saying is like we need everyone to fight the climate crisis we're not making content and we're not creating literature and educational materials that is accessible to everyone so how are we how are we going to get everyone to understand um so you know having content um that you know it has captioning and has um you know other accommodations for deaf and hard of hearing people um that we that we use alt text it's readily available in most of our social media it's like literally not complicated i'm begging you please use alt text <laughs> um and i think just continuing to understand that like disability accommodations and disability justice should not be an afterthought uh all justice is disability justice there is not one there i i would literally sell all of my soul to have you find one intersection where disability does not intersect because we the the, the incredibly special thing about disabilities that we fit into every single nexus and we fit into every single justice issue um and if i'm being incredibly honest if you're not including people with disabilities in your environmental justice work or any justice work for that matter you're not really fighting for equitable justice you're just fighting for justice that's ableist and that fits into your parameters of what normal is but justice doesn't discriminate justice is for everyone and we need everyone to make it happen. I also think that and the environmental justice movement likes to make likes to create solutions that may, that don't work for people with disabilities because it's easier to say that we don't matter and that we're invisible and it makes people feel better about themselves and say, "Yes, we created this amazing solution." Well, sorry to break it to you, it actually is ableist and doesn't work. So you might want to take that back to the drawing board because you have to figure some stuff out there. Um, and I think it's very easy to to not think about us because it, it doesn't benefit the overall movement and it it makes people feel better about their arbitrary solutions. I also think that. There is increased um, isolation when we talk about um, access to transportation and mobility. A lot of disabled people they live in in care facilities like nursing home and other things like that. Um, and they're excuse me, they're usually on the outskirts of communities and towns, which means that they have less access to resources. Um, and this has only been exacerbated during the pandemic. Um, I think that society puts us puts us on the outskirts of these things so that we're easily forgettable and that and so that we're easy to not think about. Um, but more than it hurts us, I think it's an incredible disadvantage to the movement in general. Um, I also think that. It is like what is ally what does allyship look like for able bodied people um helping disabled people enter the climate conversations? I think it's knowing when to step back and being like why why isn't this representation happening? Something I always do like i'm I am the notorious plus one person. Like whenever, whenever I'm invited to a conversation, oh, can I bring these people? And it's like, it's holding these systems accountable and saying, these are the gaps I'm seeing within the representation and with the conversations we have, we're having. Here are the people you should be including, even if that means you yourself are not part of the conversation, because so many, it, there's a huge pattern in the in the youth environmental justice movement where it's the same voices over and over again and it's like honestly i'm tired of hearing your voice <laughs> um and even myself there's times where i'm like okay i'm taking up too much space in this one particular area let me step back and highlight other voices who are doing incredible work within this space and it's the notion of like 
when one of us wins, we all win. We're all working together to create a more equitable and just movement. And there doesn't need to be this this rat race of like who gets the most promotion, who gets the most visibility. Because at the end of the day, if you have a dead planet, who cares about how many followers you have on social media? It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, this is what this is, and like what what is your activism look like if the internet went down tomorrow? Would you have anything to show for your organizing and for your movement work? You probably you probably wouldn't. Um, and that that was a little tea, but <laughs> but sometimes sometimes you need it. Um, but I, I think for me in general, over this Earth Month. Something that I did a lot was hold my hold my friends in the space account of one say, you're launching these huge campaigns. Are there people with disabilities in these campaigns? No. Well, then you should hold these organizations accountable. And some friends stepped up and some friends didn't. And, and those, it's that in action that speaks volumes more than any other, other, you know, organizing that they may be doing. I also think it's important, and I always tell young organizers to also hold those organizations accountable. Um, you know, when I, I'm being contracted for like brand partnerships and stuff, it's like, okay, thank you for including me in this, you know, campaign. But after this campaign's over, like, how are you going to continue to uphold these new ideals that you claim to be promoting? And it's like, long after this campaign is over, I want that positive impact to continue and not just in the in the moment of whatever's popular and trendy um i also think that like it's okay to say no like you can you can want to desperately be part of something cool looking and flashing whatever but like if it doesn't align with your heart and your community like don't sell yourself out for that like there's no point um because at the end of the day, like, when we're all wrinkly and old, like, nobody's going to remember that billboard that you put up on Times Square. They're going to remember the things that you did for your community and how you made, you know, how you made your community better. I wish more people understood the joy of communities like mine, where it isn't always just about, like, we're poor, our people are dying, our people are struggling. There is joy here, and, like, it isn't it isn't devoid of happiness yes it's hard and there is struggle but that doesn't mean that we don't find joy for so long I didn't feel like I was part of the disabled community I just felt like I was in this limbo of like someone who wasn't like everyone else but also someone who didn't know where they belonged so I was just like in this space of not knowing how to define myself um to the point where sometimes I even said like I, I didn't even feel disabled and I had this internalized ableism against myself where it's like I tried so hard to run away from that notion um and it wasn't until I got older that I realized like my disability is my greatest superpower and like it makes me absolutely the person I was meant to be uh it's something that I always tell people like if 20 years from now they come up with like a magical cure to like take away my disability what i what i take it what i jump with the opportunity and i say absolutely not because m my disability is one of the proudest parts of myself and it makes me everything that i am and i've also learned so many things about people and life um because of my disability and it's also given me an immense amount of empathy and understanding of humans that i wouldn't have learned otherwise if it wasn't for my disability um and i think it's it's those same tools that make people that make disabled people incredibly necessary in climate conversations it's that resilience and that ability to come up with solutions um and that innovation and that fight within our community that make us um pivotal to these climate conversations you know i'm out here trying to be my ancestors wildest dreams trying to achieve everything that they only wish that they could um and the only way i'm going to do that is like being by being my authentic self um and by embracing all the parts of me that make me who i am um 
so yeah my community has has really uplifted and shaped me to be everything that I am uh and I think that a lot of people consider uh BIPOC youth to be less powerful but I actually think we are some of the most powerful people because we've learn to overcome adversity and to overcome uh, people's perception of who they think we can be and the things that we can achieve um, and achieve things even greater than what they imagine. I also think that like we are diverse interesting people with with heritage and culture and like that should be celebrated and not erased. Hello again, this is Kari Slaughter, Director of Design at OCV. Thank you all for listening and thank you, Daphne, for taking the time to share your story with us today. Thanks to Aletta Brady for interviewing Daphne and to all the folks on the OCV team that have made this and other episodes possible. If you'd like to engage further with OCV, you can find us on Instagram at Our Climate Voices or on our website at www.ourclimatevoices.org. Stay tuned for more episodes about the intersection of disability justice and the climate crisis in the coming months. See you then.